All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for participating in this workshop, despite the difficult circumstances that we experience, like on a global level. And um, yeah, I'm Sigrun from the Mosaic Rooms and um, here in London and delighted to host this event in partnership with Mohammed and the New Center and to welcome all speakers. Um, can you all, I hope you can hear me well. Um, I would also like to um, take a moment to thank everyone involved who um, yeah, made this event possible. Also Lisa Demel and Kasra from the New Center and um, anyone else who helped promoting the event. Um, so just a few words about the mosaic rooms to everyone who is not familiar with it yet. We are a gallery and bookshop for contemporary art and culture and with our program and exhibitions, we aim to initiate dialogue and debate about social, political and cultural is issues in the, middle, um, in the Arab world and beyond. We just opened Heba Amin's solo exhibition um, when I see the future, I close my eyes, which is curated by Anthony Downey and um, accompanied by a public program that is also developed with Heba and Anthony. The program features artists, thinkers and activists who engage with the themes of Heba's practice and further investigate urgent and contemporary questions prompted by the exhibition. I'm very pleased to introduce Heba and Anthony as they will introduce the program more in depth and also say a few more words about the event, Collective Infrastructures and Knowledge Production in a Post-Digital Age. Heba Amin is a multimedia artist from Egypt. She works with political themes and archival history using mediums, including film, photography, lecture performance, and installation. She teaches at Bard College Berlin, is a doctorate fellow in art history at Freie Universität and a current field of vision fellow in New York. She is a co-founder of Black Athena Collective curator of visual art for the Misner Journal and co-curator for the biennial residency program Default with Random Association. Anthony Downey is um, professor of visual culture in the Middle East and North Africa at Birmingham City University. He is currently a co-investigator on AHRC and GCRF funded research projects that focus on cultural practices, education and digital methodologies in Lebanon, Palestine, and Jordan. He sits on the editorial boards of Third Text and Digital War, respectively, and is a serious editor of research practice um, by Sternberg Press from 2019 and ongoing. And maybe one more thing I forgot to mention, the Mosaic Rooms are a project of the A.M. Katan Foundation in Palestine. And um, yeah, I wish us a good start to the event and hand over to Anthony. Sigrun, thank you very much. Uh, and I would like to thank everyone at the Mosaic Rooms and Lisa Demel for their support in organizing this panel uh, and indeed the public program. Folks, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk about the connection between the show. I'm putting on my curatorial hat here and talking about the connection between the show, some of the questions that have been raised in the show and how they relate to the public program. Um, as most of you no doubt know, the show itself relates or engages with a series of questions. And those questions are around drone technologies, surveillance systems, and digital authoritarianism. And one of the things that became apparent to myself and Heba from the outset is that all of these projects exist within platforms which were made possible by digital technologies. So when we came to think about an expanded online program, it largely became a question of what forms of critical knowledge about the digital could be produced through digital means. And of course, uh, COVID <laughs> helped, if I may say that, in as much as it, it, it put us in a position where we had to rethink certain elements of the show and its expanded context. But I think it was always key to have and I's thinking about the show uh, as to how it would engage critically with uh, digital means of dissemination. So we, approached a number of uh, collaborative partners, including the Research Institute for Technical Aesthetics, LITA, uh, led by Barut Gottlieb and others. We approached Mohammed Salemni at the New Center for Research and Practice for today's event. Uh, we will also have a, a number of future events, including the launch, the inaugural launch of the Journal of Digital War on the 3rd of December, and our upcoming collaborations with Cairo Tronica and the Undoing Fascism's database. 
And all of the information relating to that program is available on the Mosaic Rooms. We will also run a further series of events in 2021. And again, we will keep you up to date on that. But I think to return to the show and the public program, I think one of the key questions for Heba and I was pretty simple, actually. As soon as you position or pose practice as a means to produce knowledge, however expanded that ideal of knowledge is, you always run the danger of reducing it to a functional and quantifiable activity. And as we all doubt, uh, no doubt know, uh, such quantifiable activities, they can be very easily co-opted into neoliberal systems of instrumentalization. And indeed, they can support neoliberal systems of instrumentalization. I think in the field of artistic and institutional practice, when it comes to any claim on knowledge production, they need to be critically examined. Those claims need to be critically examined. So it's at this point that Hebat and I started our conversation about what the show could become, uh, specifically what the show could become as a means to produce knowledge about drone technologies, surveillance systems, and digital authoritarianism that took the problematic of instrumentalization as a starting point. We wanted to open up a question about the affordances of digital media. What do such systems afford us when it comes to rethinking debates about knowledge production and transfer, and hence approaching Mohammed Salemani and the new Center for Research and Practice who have long engaged with precisely these issues. So the question Heba and I were left with was relatively simple. How does practice think through and critically engage with digital systems of knowledge production rather than merely exist within them? And I suppose I could sum that up by saying that what we really want to explore is epistemic politics in a digital age or a post-digital age indeed. I could say a lot more, but perhaps we'll come back to that as part of the discussion. Uh, for now, I want to hand over to Heba who will say a few further words. Thank you, Anthony. Um, I, I will just be very brief, uh, but want to thank uh, Muhammad and the New Center. Uh, for participating. It was very important for me to reach out um, to such an organization who has been dealing um, with these topics for quite some time and preceding everybody who's kind of grappling with uh, these problems of working through and thinking through technology in this pandemic, uh, in the time of the pandemic. And so, um, so I see the new center as a space that we can learn from having dealt with these long before the pandemic. Um, but also um, was keen on uh, uh, collaborating with, with the new center due to several things that they highlight as part of their mission statement and particularly in providing these alternative spaces um, for knowledge production um, and, and kind of using these alternative spaces um, uh, to explore thought and use them through action. Um, and so I want to thank everybody uh, that's involved um, and especially Mohammed for um, uh, organizing this with us. And I'd particularly like to thank the speakers for agreeing to take part in this. Um, and most importantly, I'd like to thank Mosaic Rooms and the Qatan Foundations um, without whom, without their support, uh, none of these events would have been possible. Um, so Mohammed, uh, the floor is yours. Muhammad, you're on mute, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Um, so, hello everyone. When Hiba approached me to think about a module or some kind of like a part of the public program for her exhibition, of course, we come from like six or six plus years of organizing seminars and workshops and summer schools uh, around these themes, but also using online and offline technologies. One thing that has been occupying my mind from the beginning of the, the pandemic and the sort of like a rush to move uh, education and knowledge production to Zoom and other online technologies due to restrictions of the use of physical space is how this, this Zoom space, because of being flat and flat and one dimensional in a way, creates a lot of distraction and creates a lot of like waste of time and been thinking of all these people complaining about like 
uh, falling asleep in Zoom, like getting distracted and thinking about ways to experiment so we can put this time, this possible time of distraction into use. People take notes, people take drawings, people chat with each other usually like, and all sorts of stuff already. We've seen how it wor works out at the new center. Usually our, our sidebar chats are very important sources of like, like links and funny anecdotes about stuff that's being talked about right at the moment, often distracting the instructor from like the course of a, their lecture, right? So I thought, imagine a, a string of text or if you can like think about that, that sidebar chat in a more productive way and do something with it. So now Martino will explain a little bit more about how we're gonna do this, but, but to provide a basis for this, it's like, I just wanna go back to the first instance of thinking about New Center and the sort of like the moment for me that things congeal. And that's why it's kind of related to the second session and why Reza is invited. It was like, it was in the sort of like the fall of 2012, I was enrolled at NYU, at NYU for just one semester for one seminar only. And that was Alexander Galloway's two credit PhD seminar on Deleuze. And then he had promised on, on Facebook that like, this is the last time I'm gonna teach Deleuze because Deleuze has been completely subsumed by new liberal so like um, information technology and he is just, there's nothing new in the loose that we should be talking about. So this is the last time I want to teach it. And then what he was also doing was comparing in the second half of the, the second half of the seminar, ideas of Deleuze with Laruelle, which was very new to me. And I was beginning to read Laruelle because of translations of Robin McKay, particularly the book on photography, right? And these seminars um, with, with Alex were sort of like, prior to like uh, idea of surveillance capitalism, like these stuff were like discussed back then, right? Like how these systems are sort of like making a copy of the world, how they're sort of like uh, taking over like the, the sort of like extracting data from the world and how these data will be fed into algorithms and all these were kind of like creating a sense of nihilism in me. And so sort of like feeling like, like the end of the world almost. And then there was, there was an announcement that Reza is coming to New York for, for, for a lecture at uh, Miguel Abro Gallery. And I was very curious to meet Reza because I had heard about his name and I was following Cyclopedia very suspiciously because I also thought of it as a kind of like a hipster word generator book that like, who is this Persian guy just throwing all these new words do they even mean something? Or is it just like another new fad? I was very skeptical. And we all went to Miguel Abro Gallery. It's a very small space, actually, the, the original Miguel Abro Gallery, very small space. I entered there and I basically saw half of the New York intellectual community and, and media, media theory types and all sorts of people I knew from Facebook. They were all there. Like half of the room were like important people. The other half were all sitting on the floor to the capacity waiting to meet this like mysterious figure who was the first time showing her face, his face to public in America. And Reza gave this magnificent lecture on basically the limits of these systems and how these limits basically has to do with, to just paraphrase Reza's long lecture, which exists in a tape format. And I later did an exhibition around it called um, Encyclopedia Iranica in Vancouver a year later, where I invited a group of Iranian artists to respond to Reza's lecture and produce works around that lecture and became kind of like the seat of the new center with a public program I put together later called in Incredible Machines a year later, six months later in Vancouver in 2014. So like it, it went from Reza's talk to the exhibition, to the conference and to the new center, right? And Reza's main point was that what we consider AI, what we consider this computational paradigm, it, it's always dealing with known facts from the past. It's not a real Janus head, which is like looking at the past, but also looking at the pres future through present and trying to synthesize these two. Our computational systems are, are relying on past data and they, they, they do not match the type of AI that, that, that we, we've received from sci science fiction or the AI that we think of as like this intelligent system 
on par with human mind. And basically the propositions that Reza was providing was that before we can come up with an AI that deals with the future, we need a kind of system that can deal with the present and add, add a confrontation with the present with the, with the kind of like accumulation of information about the past, which is sort of like history, which is always edited and filtered, right? And how this, this like confrontation with the present together with this will find us a way to open up a way into systems that actually can speculate and actually can think about the future. This to me was sort of like a, sort of like a light at the end of the tunnel that came out of like study that that's sort of like a dark study of Deleuze with Galloway, right? And of course Galloway was there and he completely disagreed with Reza in, in question and answer, question and answer. But, but uh, my, my interest in the topic kind of began in that moment and in that lecture, right? So, so here we are, we're, we're almost at the same place, right? The, the dark vision of dealing with the present is kind of like realized, how many of you are familiar with, the, with surveillance capitalism, right? So like this, this data capturing systems are the sort of like nightmare of dealing with the present. Like, like you have these systems that are constantly turning present into, into past data and constantly observing and sort of like crunching it into what they know of the past in order to think about the future, right? So we're here to basically discuss and talk about ways that we can transcend this, right? And of course, Valentin here can be very, very useful for this conversation because he has practical experience creating systems that try to do that. And of course, as, as you read more about it, especially in the end of, end, end of um, Zuboff's book, and a lot of people are coming to this kind of like conclusion is that what we need is a, is a sort of like a, somehow humans have to be involved. Like this dream of an independent AI is kind of like over. And only with human, human interaction with these, with these um, smart systems, one can expect a kind of like a like an AI that that we've been dreaming in in in, in sci-fi, right? So here we are, as a group of humans, and actually, an, another 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 insight from from Valentin as we were planning this this is the whole existence of New Center. If you think of it, there are many online educational platforms, right? You know, like basically create your own seminar, teach your own course, right? Anyone can just like basically like based on the popularity on social media or the network they have. So like use any of these platforms that allow you to sort of like create a, a room where you can discuss things, create a seminar, teach. What, what makes New Center different is, is not, not, not that we started early or we provided this type of academic service early, but it's the kind of topic and the kind of people, both in terms of like anthropology, but also in terms of their thoughts, right? The kind of group they come from, where they come from, right? That kind of like make up what makes us a special. And to just put it, put it in blunt language, and I'm quoting Valentin, right? Like people who are attracted to New Center are people who have one foot in the real world, they've already are in a direction towards some kind of a career or a future in the, in the field of one foot in the philosophy, knowledge production, but they still maintain a foot in a world of research ideas, right? And they're, they're disappointed at the direction of mainstream academia and, and the way it's unable to support them with a career after education. They're still utopian in terms of there must be a better alternative and better future. So that's what make, make, up, make up both the people who teach at the new center and the students. And in fact, the students or researcher are basically the same as the instructors, except they're like a little bit behind in the timeline because they're younger. And that's why it's very easy to, for any, of, any number of our students to immediately teach at the new center because conceptually they're exactly in the same demographic category as our instructors. Right? Any one of you, if you develop your ideas a little bit further, you'll be, you'll be teaching seminars to people who are just 
just new at the news center, right? So that's what makes us interesting and makes us a special compared to other platforms or other initiatives that, that produce knowledge online. And also the other thing is that from the very beginning, because of uh, influences of people like Reza, uh, Ray Brassier, and others who have really thought rigorously about this automated future, this algorithmic future, our topic of conversation has been a lot around these, these things. So we have a good sort of like basis to address these issues, right? So that's why we're here and that's why we would like to do this experiment with you. Mostly here are the new center people and hopefully we can sort of like elevate the, the discussion just like spontaneously and together here. And hopefully the, the tool that Valentin has installed on the new center, new center website for today's experiment will be kind of useful to add a little bit of humor, but also a little bit of like criticality. How many of you know about GP3? You've heard about GP3, right? I'm sure Jesse knows about it, right? Yeah. So it's this, this is sort of like a, like a basic, it's a like GP minus three, the, the tool that we have. But it's very interesting because it kind of shows the limits of GP3, right? But also allows you to have a little bit more fun because GP3 is really a black box at this point, right? Jesse, do you mind just for the just to the knowledge of others? I mean, I can also say G, GP3 is how many of you read that article on on um, Guardian that said this article was completely written by AI? It was like a month ago, right? That was like the first big public expose of GP3, right? Where like uh, this Guardian article was written, but basically GP3 is a very smart um, automated system for generation of knowledge and text. It basically, you feed it a paragraph of text. It's usually the best for 300 to 300 words or 150 words. The more you give it, the more it has. But then it has like millions of association already picked from every text available online. And it basically continues to write the text for you and finishes it for you. Just recently, a blogger who had access to the beta version of it, I have access to it through a friend. So I don't have my own account, but I'm, I know a friend who has access and I can experiment with it. And possibly we can maybe like gather what we have from this session at the end of the second session and I can pass it to my friend and see to feed it to GP3 and see what GP3 will give us back in terms of what we produce today, right? But basically GP3 is able to kind of like continue the line of your thought and finish writing the article and then give you a full on article that basically in a lot of cases passes the Turing test, making it making people think that this really was produced by a human being. And just recently, a, a, a tech blogger was able to use a friend's account and generate one of these about hacking that, that became viral and had like, I don't know, millions of millions of clicks and likes and shares. And when people who were smarter in the comment talked about the possibility of it being fake, those comments were like voted down and destroyed because people were like, no, this can be true. This is so smart. I learned so much from it. This can be like AI, right? So the tool we have is kind of like a very basic version of the same thing to kind of like tie it in with like, with like Reza's talk. It's totally the example of what Reza talks about, right? Like basically you have to, this AI that completely depends on past knowledge, right? But hopefully with our own interaction with a group of intelligent researchers who've been thinking about this which are you here we, we would be able to able to elevate the elevate the discourse and do something with it okay so i think this is enough for my introduction martina would you like to introduce yourself and maybe talk a little bit about what what the actual the actual the distraction part because the other part of it is kind of like clear we will go through a presentation by Valentin and Brunella and an exchange between them. And we can also ask some questions as we also do the other part of the work, which is the output. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Mohammed, And thanks, Heba and Anthony and everyone at Mosaic Rooms for having us. Um, I guess that was interesting about what you said. Maybe today we will try and activate a bit of that um, confrontation with the present you were just talking about now, which is interesting. Um, I'll keep it really brief. I just want to run through what we're going to do today. Um, the session is divided into two parts. So we're going to have a first half where Brunella and Valentin will give us a short presentation. Um, 
And then without wanting to say too much about what we'll get into, but Valentin will introduce to us like a very interesting tool, um, which will kind of allow us to build an interface, a sort of, um, let's call it like a collective toolbox through which we will be able to um, generate a collective glossary together. Um, so I think for the purpose of this, it'd be really, really handy um, for everyone to perhaps take notes and uh, sketch things on the side, um, make annotations of words that come to mind or that stick with you, because um, this will be something that we will look at later on. Um, I think um, it's, it may be helpful to, for everyone involved to introduce themselves very briefly. Uh, I know Mohammed will introduce Brunella and Valentin, but perhaps uh, if people feel like it, we can take a little bit of time, uh, just maybe a few words each for um, participants to introduce themselves. Um, let me see. I think it's important if we do that, so, so Valentin and Brunella have an idea who they're talking to, right? Yeah, let's, maybe I can, if that's okay, I can call people's names. If you're there, um, show yourself and say a couple of words about yourself. And if not, that's fine. Um, I guess, uh, Andrew, do you wanna start? Sure, thanks. Uh, so I'm Andrew, uh, my background is in architecture um, and my research interests have generally been to do with logistics um, and labor the labor of logistics. So I'm interested to see how that might intersect with this idea of collective infrastructure in a more digital realm. Thanks. Um, Alex, do you wanna go next? Sure. Hi everybody. Uh, my name is Alex. I'm from Oakland, California. And uh, I am outside of academia currently, but my background is in architectural theory and media studies. And I'm also a, a writer and interdisciplinary artist. So thank you. Enda? Hiya. Um, yeah, my name is Enda. Uh, I just finished an MFA in fine art at Goldsmiths. So part of the Goldsmiths Mafia. Um, my interest generally, I mean, my background before that was in philosophy. So my, my, my kind of interests are between art and philosophy, generally thinking about questions of mind and subject in relation to large scale systems uh, and dimensionally varied complexity. Um, so yeah, there's like a lot that that covers, I guess, like uh, global finance, smart cities, algorithmic, go uh, uh, algorithmic governance, um, distribution chains, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's it. Uh, Maria, do you want to go next? Uh, thank you, Martina. Uh, my name is Maria Koroleva. I'm uh, in Moscow. I'm an art critic and I explore here what we can do with uh, the methodology of uh, what we write with uh, philosophy. Um, Evrim? Uh, my name is Evrim. Uh, I'm from Turkey, Istanbul. I'm currently I'm a PhD student in philosophy at Leipzig University. Uh, I have a background in continental philosophy and Deleuze in particular. Uh, I am also at the New Center. Thank you. Uh, Dana? Hey, um, I'm in New York. Um, I'm not in academia. I'm coming at this from a background of um, anarchist organizing and mutual aid. So I'm interested in kind of developing knowledge, not as a thing that I possess or own, but as a commoning exercise. Uh, James? Hi, can you hear me? Hey, um, sorry, I'm not at home, so the audio is so bad. I won't be talking too much today, but uh, I'm James, I'm a certificate student at the New Centre, and also a recent um, alumnus of the Goldsmiths Mafia. I'm quite interested in uh, topics relating to like uh, doomsday and like time systems and technology. And, uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Aladdin. Hi. Uh, my name is Aladdin. I have a background in fine art and visual anthropology. 
and I'm mostly working uh, around bees and our relationship with them. And yeah, thanks. And I think we're missing Eric. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, I'm Eric. My background is in sociology and philosophy. I also study at the News Center, and I'm here because I'm very interested in like the how to overcome at least the seeming dilemma of democracy and specialization of knowledge. And I'm interested in what instruments we will develop. I just want to add one word about, about Eric. Uh, Eric just conducted a very fascinating conversation with one of the people whose article we read the review of the Zuboff book, Rob Lucas. I totally encourage everyone to kind of like watch it because it somehow relates to the discussion today, but also it, it just adds a little bit more to the, to the discussion. The video is available on the New Center YouTube channel. And this was yesterday, right, Eric? Or it was the day before yesterday? The day before yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, and then I think we're still missing a couple of people. Jesse, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure, thanks. Uh, my name is Jesse Joshua Benjamin. I'm a certificate student at the New Center as well. Um, and I'm also doing a PhD in philosophy of technology. And basically what I'm interested in is kind of like a phenomenological or post phenomenological uh, gray area between kind of technical correctness and the lived truth, so to speak. Um, so kind of the tension between fidelity and facticity, basically. Really interesting. Um, I think then we're missing Zenobia. Hello, everyone. Uh, my background is in uh, design, and I'm interested in the relations with the speculative realism and accelerationism ideas and what is left of it today uh, between speculative design and what uh, we can create with these approaches uh, together, the new technologies and so forth. Great. Um, hey, so, I think, go uh, Mohamed. I, I, think, I think since like the presentation are gonna about to begin, so as distractions, so maybe Martina, we should, get Castro to pull up the interface of the system, right? And not necessarily explain what it is because he'll be the one who inputs it, right? But basically make people aware of what we're doing just briefly, right? So then so then, the, 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 the production of the glossary and all the other stuff that gonna get added will begin right away rather than after Valentin's explanation, right? So to do that, maybe, maybe Castro, maybe you wanna pull up the the screen. Yeah, there we go. And uh, Martina, do you want to just like briefly explain? Yeah, of sure. Um, link to, to take a look, but you're not going to see what Castro is doing. You're going to see an individual version of it for yourself, right? But don't waste your time trying to understand it and input it because we have someone here, Castro, who will do that, right? But just, just just for you to know what we're doing in the background with the with the terms, sentences, phrases, and concepts that you provide us in the group chat on the site. Go ahead, Martina. So basically, this is a tool that Valentin provided us with, and it's a tool where we can um, intervene, and it's completely modular, so we can change it over and over again. And it would, it's, it's, as soon as we re-roll it, it's going to produce different outputs. And so this is going to be a, a really interesting um, exercise in input and output. And I guess what you're seeing now, it's the most basic iteration of this tool. Um, and you'll be able to see that um, we can introduce new words and we can introduce what we're calling new symbols. And as long as we keep everything into the origin box, uh, we'll be able to re-roll and see a increasingly um, bigger and bigger amount of st stochastic iterations of what the production of this tool can be. Um, so Valentin will run us through this in more detail, but our idea of 
a production of a collective glossary is that everyone, whilst we're going through this presentation, will have this running in the background. And if everyone is contributing uh, their own thoughts, their own words, uh, their own symbols um, in the chat box, Kasra will be able to implement them into his own versions and we'll see this tool animate and become alive and uh, create new iterations. And again, this is a very rudimentary explanation of it. Valentin will come in uh, with tech support and explaining things in detail, but this is the framework so that everyone is aware of what we're doing whilst we're running the session. Yeah, like you don't need to run it. You can just look at this, but provide us your concepts in the, in the group chat of Zoom. So then, then Castor can input them into the system. Okay. Okay, maybe we can go back to the video screens, Castor. Okay, so I know we said Valentin a lot of time, but actually I would like to begin by introducing Brunella. And maybe Brunella can can do the do her presentation first. We had a chance to work with Brunella last semester. Uh, she taught a very fascinating seminar on cybernetics for the new center. Some of you were probably in the seminar. I'm not sure how many of you were, were taking it, but Brunella teaches aesthetics and contemporary philosophy at John Cobalt University, Rome. She has a multidisciplinary background in contemporary epistemology, aesthetics, anthropology, post-humanism. Recent publications include La Machine Nubili and the English one, Thinking Through Error, The Moving Target of Knowledge, and Maiden Machine, Philosophy of the Age of the Unborn Women, which is printed in 2013. Brunella, would you like to take over the video and begin? Thank you very much, Mohammed, for the invitation. I like this uh, experimental format very much. I think it's uh, a great challenge to uh, scholars and intellectuals, exactly because we are used to think uh, uh, the future is the past, as it is said by AI. That is, we um, think that uh, collecting data means uh, to get to a solution. But this is, of course, a false because uh, uh, if AI are biased, it's because uh, humans make them and they take all the data from humans. And of course, they cannot be unbiased. If we have called it AI that is artificial, because we haven't artificial intelligence in early modernity. That is, Descartes uh, considering reason as something that uh, some source of um, some input, innate input that gives a, a certain output. This is exactly a prehistory of AI. We've, given, we've been given a, a inputs by God in the same way in which we give a, a system, an artificial system input from which it, gi it gives out an output. So this is actually a, a due to a binary logic that uh, considers in a mutual opposition, uh, artificial and natural, bias and biased, right and wrong, uh, truth and error. And of course, this is again something highly artificial. Uh, it's not the, the, the problem with uh, thinking through this uh, uh, inevitable bias is uh, what to do. And this is why I appreciate this, uh, the challenge, how uh, I am invited to think in a different way that is uh, projected into the future and not into the past. So what is bias? What is bias? It is an error, an error in the system. <clears throat> what is an error? It is a chaos. It is a chaotic element that uh, doesn't allow the system to work properly. Or if it does, it is even more dangerous because we think that the output, the output is uh, objective while it, it isn't. So what to do? We have, I would like to uh, uh, mention a sentence that I found in the Zuboff's uh, review, uh, which says, from its outset, the modern state has been an information gathering apparatus. So again, there's nothing really new or revolutionary or dangerous in AI. 
And if there's anything uh, more dangerous than in the past, uh, it's not the fact that it is connected to politics or political power, it, because this has always been the case. It's not the danger of fake news, because fake news have always been the, the case since, I don't know, Roman Empire, or probably even before that. Uh, but the danger is that now the, the danger is globalized. That is, we cannot, we seem not to find a way out. <clears throat> so my <clears throat> short introduction, we will uh, focus on the fact that instead of using, <clears throat> instead of considering AI as something external to us, given that, as Mohammed says in the title, we live in a post-digital age, let's consider it as a part of ourselves. Let's internalize, because we, we have already internalized it. Uh, let's consider it as a matter of fact, uh, which means that it's not even anything projected on a screen. It has entered our lives, the uh, Internet of Things, uh, and so on. I do not uh, enter this, of course. Uh, but this means that we have to cope with it. How to cope with it? We have uh, two problems. One is uh, how dangerous is uh, AI? How can it uh, be considered as something that is inevitably in the hands of power, which is another matter of fact, of course, uh, uh, not everyone can uh, reach the, uh, the, the instrumentation, can use the instrumentation. Uh, and therefore, how can, to what extent can we trust it? This is one problem. Uh, to what extent can we appropriate it? I don't have a solution for that. Second, can we, you can't we think, and this is my solution, can't we think of it as a, 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 an alternative use, an alternative use? Can't we find some source that suggests that it is possible to use it in a way that is not instrumental, that doesn't instrument, that doesn't reify us, etc. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I would proceed by saying, uh, first a suggestion, let's forget about causes. So this is the intellectualist attitude, the hypercritical attitude of the end of the 20th century. The end of the 20th century gave us the impression that when we are objectified, when we are uh, turned into atoms and passive uh, puppets uh, in the, into the hands of uh, reason or rational things, thinking. <clears throat> We, our humanity, our humanity is uh, destroyed and is ruined. This is not completely true, exactly because, exactly because uh, by dint of thinking of the causes why humans are treated as objects, we still think about the past. We still think that the past is the future. We think that uh, there's no solution. This is the uh, this is the danger of considering AI as an adversary. Therefore, let's forget about the causes and let's think of how to use errors as errors are already always in the, our environments. Second, let's forget about the opacity, impenetrability of AI, the black box. The, the black, our brain is a black box. So, let, so let's not think that we must master AI. I don't know, there's no individual in the world, in the technological world, that is able to make a whole computer, for instance, a whole program, a whole uh, airplane, a whole satellite, specialized, uh, um, knowledge implies that we have a collective knowledge and we have a collective technological uh, investment. Therefore, let's not consider the fact that we must uh, open that black box. I would say let's use it as we always have used, uh, keep using technologies that we do not master. Even in the past, you know, entering a steam engine train, uh, most people didn't know how it, it it worked. Uh, electricity, we do not know all the details how it works, but it's not uh, threatening uh, in any case. So uh, I would say this is our, let's go, these are the problems. So let's, con let's consider our condition. We live in a condition of sailing by sight. We sail by sight, especially in this moment, nobody could predict the COVID and now the COVID has changed abruptly our lives. 
uh, I, I refer, I given the students the suggestions of this book by Vespignani, Italian physicist who works in Boston. Unfortunately, the book is not in, in English. So he uh, proposes a use of AI that deals with chaos. So that is the first uh, AIs, maybe Valentin knows better than I, the first AI programs were uh, dealt with uh, linear, simple environments. So to the, the, the a programmer gives an input and the AI is very quickly able to give an output. This uh, sounded like, uh, sounded too simple. So now, they, now you know, in the, at the end of the 90s, uh, they have replaced it with the simulation. Simulation uh, allows for gathering all data that are uh, collected in a way that is uh, non-linear, that is we have uh, many different levels of descri description of an event and every event is made of many non-linear factors that uh, must be um, analyzed in their fullness in order to give a probable, of course we're talking about probable, output and this can be done by simulation, can be done by simulation. So Vespignan by using these uh, new models of AI through simulation is able to collect uh, data from chaotic, uh, data from uh, events that seem to be chaotic, but can lead, seem to be headed to order. What does it mean? Simulation being uh, at the same time working with nonlinear factors of an event and very quickly are able to show, these programs are able to show how from chaos an event passes to order. And it brings, of course, uh, examples from political choices, uh, from uh, earthquakes, uh, from viruses. Actually, he uh, is, uh, is being given a, a certain momentum now, uh, in, at least in Italy, because he actually predicted the COVID, uh, predicted the next uh, pandemic. He wasn't used because his work is too experimental, I don't know. This could be another problem. How come that we didn't predict it? Anyway, uh, what's interesting is that uh, the, the model of this uh, usage of AI uh, can is able to turn, is able to consider error inside of the system and in a way that the system itself corrects the error. Very simple example, uh, swarm intelligence of the birds. Okay, Swarm intelligence of the birds, how come that they make decisions without having a central processor, without having a leader, a guide, um, this probably is nothing new, but they find out that uh, this uh, mechanism is the same that works when people walk in a very, you know, in a very crowdy place, that is uh, each element takes care for the uh, immediate uh, seven other elements around itself, keeps at the same pace, keeps close to everyone else. So very uh, three very simple rules that explains how chaos, what seems to be chaotic, becomes orderly and can reach uh, a result, a, a good result. So why insisting on that? Because this is a suggestion how to think of using AI to consider biases, errors, chaotic events. Uh, for instance, I would like to consider some uh, uh, examples. What came to my mind was, um, for instance, the, um, the phenomenon Greta. Greta can be seen as a chaotic, as a chaotic event. Uh, this young girl has a strange reasons to uh, go out to school, sit down and show this uh, post to everyone, you know, something that uh, seems to touch the psychopathology. Uh, at the same time, she becomes viral. She becomes a mediatic event. So are 
these elements errors or uh, or not and uh, uh, she travels as uh, you know she, she she travels through ocean to the oceans uh, on a ship that uh, uh, makes a kind of scandal you know we have migrants that dine on the ocean and she travels with Casiraghi's uh, yacht uh, she comes back by flight uh, polluting the air <laughs> as, uh, very quickly but uh, what is the problem the problem is that what is the issue that she has a good effect okay so it's uh, from this chaotic mixture of something uh, we have an output that uh, helps understand something more uh, at least you know making people more sensible uh, increasing the awareness about uh, about the problem. Uh, so, instead, so I would uh, suggest students uh, to uh, focus on anticipating, okay? AI is made for prediction, but we can consider prediction in two possible ways. One is a prediction from many, many data, big data, which takes uh, uh, many, many computers or too many computers to be something uh, accessible. Uh, but why don't you take AI in a way in which you can uh, build the programs of simulations that are simply aimed at anticipating the next future? This is what I learned from Vespignani. It's not a matter of accumulating all big data, but just uh, the most recent data that can tell us what to do or what's going to happen in the immediate future. So we have T1, one, the first time slot, and the T2. So uh, 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 my suggestion would be to use, uh, to, to think, uh, to imagine the next future, the way in which a certain, we would like a certain event to occur from T1 to T2. To T2 in a very short time slot. Instead of thinking about the future, utopia, let's think what's wrong with what was wrong yesterday. How can I correct uh, this error of yesterday into the next future? So, um, my suggestion is think of how would you would imagine a riot, okay? A riot uh, which is uh, not bad, you know? Uh, uh, the, the Arab Spring occurred through uh, some kind of algorithm, so it was. Uh, uh, was uh, described that can be describable by algorithms. How do you imagine a riot? How could you imagine a riot that would uh, uh, correct a certain uh, wrong in our society? And the second, how would you imagine the step? How could you imagine the, the steps, that need the intermediate steps from now, this time, and the possible solutions? So imagination is, uh, I think, what students are the only uh, weapon that uh, students uh, could do uh, in order to make, uh, in order to make, especially uh, toy models. What Mr. Prignani and the AI experts call toy models. That is, a thinking of how you might uh, simulate an event that is chaotic, gathers uh, force and order through times in order to solve a problem. The toy model is not so difficult to make. It doesn't take a political power, economic power. In Rome, I, some, you know, in a certain way, I collaborate with a, an institute of a gam gamification lab in the uh, University La Sapienza. These students actually make programs to make games, video games, that simulate what they would like to experience, to make experience of. Uh, you might think, uh, for instance, uh, what kind of school you imagine, what kind of the schooling you imagine. You know, I remember even Illich was a kind of um, uh, challenging the idea of education. Can we imagine a, a process of the schooling? What would be the, next, the, the, the intermediate step to arrive there? Can you imagine the consequences of having all robots in fact? Factories. We know the workers do not, uh, you know, suffer in factories, and not all works are replaced by robots. But if all workers are replaced by robots in factories, what would be the result concerning economy and society and professions and jobs? 
this I would be um, curious to know that. What if we stopped buying? What if we stopped being consumers? This is another problem that might be simulated in a program, a kind of toy model. Uh, it would uh, it would be a catastrophe. So uh, this is a, again uh, this uh, dialect is this exchange between error and bias and uh, and solution of the error. Uh, stop being consumers uh, damages jobs and uh, the economy. But if we keep being consumers, of course we keep uh, uh, feeding capitalism. Uh, okay, conclusion. So, uh, um, use AI against AI. So, we have at stake two kinds of intelligence. One is the Cartesian artificial intelligence, which is rigid, but is very quick and very quickly gives results. And the other one is the human intelligence that doesn't need data, doesn't need data, because we have the guesswork, what... Um, first called the guesswork. We have intuition. We do not still know exactly what intuition is, but we are able to work through these few data that we have or few hints that AI can give us in order to interpret or reach kind of future situation that we would like uh, to exist. So uh, I imagine a kind of distributed control. Can we imagine this? A distributed control, instead of renouncing, instead of renouncing being invested in AI, let's go deeper into it and let's use it uh, as much as we can. Uh, in order to uh, imagine a control that is not uh, centralized, but distributed. Uh, this is a, maybe too utopian, but this is what I, I can only think about that. How, if we think of how um, information uh, spreads, can we also, can't we also think how power can be uh, distributed horizontally and not uh, vertically? So this is a kind of blending between pragmatism Let's think uh, pragmatically, let's think uh, practically, let's practice before thinking, let's not think before practicing, before acting. Uh, pragmatism and the cybernetics, uh, in which a contingency that is uh, the, the, the latest error uh, triggers uh, our action and not the old, all of the errors of the world. We are not outside of biases. We are always uh, mixed up with the biases of uh, the world. Just one example uh, from Vespignani, they have uh, made a simulation uh, that explains uh, why uh, we tend to exclude the different. This is not just racism. This is a kind of uh, a, a mechanism that explains racism, but is more basic, is more simple. That is, each of us, and this is almost obvious, tends uh, to uh, be surrounded by similar people. And therefore, this is not simply bias, but this tells us how in a chaotic environment, so this is the experiment by Vespignani, a chaotic environment in which everyone is different from everyone else, everyone else over time, in a certain span of time, they see that without any predetermined rule, uh, the algorithm provides for clusters of people that are similar to one another. So the, the similarity is an exceptionally, an incredible order that was not planned at all. So this is just an example of how uh, things can be simulated without having any kind of uh, um, ideology, I would say. So cybernetics and pragmatism are anti-ideological. I would like to conclude by thinking of Machiavelli's prince. You know, everyone knows Machiavelli. What does the prince, the, the, the ideal prince do? He has the intelligence of actions of the next day. In order to exactly know to what to do the next day, he has to be surrounded, to surround himself with advisors. So let's use AI as advisors for actions and let's use AI as our training mates. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brunella. Valentin, are you ready to 
uh, yeah. online. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna give a bio Valentin. Valentin is an autodidact. He's a thinker, philosopher, programmer. He's been involved with the New Center for a few years. He did a very interesting seminar for us last semester on sort of quotidian understanding of AI and how AI can be reconfigured as something familiar rather than something coming from the outside world. Now, if that's, that's a good introduction, Valentin, since you provided us the, the tool, maybe you would like to first talk about Dorkheimer as so, planned, and then, and then we talk so about let, it. Let me just, let me just pick up uh, at Brunellos because like in the background uh, or like in, in what Brunel is uh, saying is this kind of idea of this action uh, being created from, from chaos and like somehow uh, this AI uh, bringing some kind of new, new approach of thinking of relationship between knowledge and action. And I want to, I want to focus on this a little bit more. Uh, the tool I propose to use is based on the thing called generative grammar. And I'm very interested in grammar for many reasons. And it's, I think it's especially pertinent for AI because AI right now is in the stage where the very grammatic rules of talking about AI, of AI's being in the world, are being discussed and are being created as we speak. What uh, we see about grammar is that grammar evolves much faster than the meaning of what it expresses. That the sentence can be formed as a meaningful sentence, uh, as, a, like, as a meaningful looking sentence, as a syntactically valid sentence before it, uh, it will be interpreted. Right? The fact that we can even say something like, Facebook manipulated my emotions into voting for Joe Biden, like the fact that we even look at this as something uh, meaningful, syntactical, and syntactical in a kind of more general way, is kind of it uh, predates the idea that we can interpret uh, what it actually means. So we first have to say something like this, and then we have to discuss how uh, what it is. And it like the fact that we can say something like this is does not even presuppose that any of this is like directly um, applicable to reality somehow. Like, you know, this famous Nietzschean interpretation of uh, a sentence lightning strikes, how it, uh, it doesn't mean that lightning exists, right? It's just like something happens and then we say there is a lightning, but there is no lightning, there is only this event. So in this sense, it's, it's very interesting how grammar works and you notice how like when you play with grammar directly, when you, instead of like going into this like realm of meaning, instead of interpreting what it all means it, by just playing with the grammar, by just pro proposing new words in place of old words, you come up with like new, new, new sentences, new structures that, um, um, it's just like they, they have this appearance of being new because they feel meaningless in a sense. But at the same time, they are very old syntactically. They completely adhere to the old uh, grammatical rules. And at the same time with grammar, it's, it's like precedent system in, you know, in uh, like British and American jurisprudence, right? It always refers to the old examples. And after you, had, uh, you have a new sentence, that was like never nobody ever thought you can say something like this. Uh, after somebody says it, it's it's you cannot like remove it. You, you just like it, 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 everything just becomes this kind of precedent that you can use to build more and more these weird sentences. Um, just I, I'm going to give you an example, and which, this example is very I think relevant to AI because um, when when you look at what what we say about AI and what we right now about like all the systems, especially the actual real systems like I don't know like Facebook feed for example or Google search, which are very complicated systems, and if if there is an artificial intelligence, those are uh, those should be examples of it. Um, and when we talk about it, uh, a lot of things you can say about them. Make me experience this kind of weird deja vu about this kind of discourse that is um, typically is done on a very different kind of level. 
So for example, when I say, when you say, you know, everyone sees your, their Facebook feed differently, or every time I Google search something, it's always different sets of results, even if it's the same board. This is, uh, 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 reminds me very, very much of, you know, this kind of Derridean, like every reading of a book is different. Like every time you read a book, you produce another book, but you see there is like kind of very big difference in mode of enunciation of this, like, or I don't know, in kind of tone of it, right? Because for, for Derrida, it means this in kind of like kind of lofty sense and in Facebook, in the case of Facebook feed, it's very, it's very down to earth. It's very specific uh, and it's very basic. And many, many, many such examples. You know, when when you read, for example, uh, Parmenid's, you know, this famous dialogue, like you you see how how you can kind of like be applicable to this kind of contemporary system in a very different way than it is applicable to being and to one in the sense that we imagine it being uh, seen by time. Right? We don't know but we imagine it like as being slightly different from what we say. And um, this leads me to uh, look for some kind of event that we could most directly compare this AI system as a subject to, right? Like what, what is this, uh, is there any kind of historical uh, situations or myths that we can uh, compare this thing to? And uh, I think a very important point of comparison would be with this founding myth of sociology, of Durkheimian uh, sociology, which goes like this, like uh, there used to be a concept of God as omnipotent, as omniscient, as uh, like Christian God, like, as one that defies any kind of research and one that is the cause of everything that's going on. And then it was not a very, uh, it's like this, this concept is uh, good for some reasons, but uh, it has its limitations. So uh, MIF goes on as uh, this kind of early sociologists, they come up with this concept of society and they have this very idea that society can be a subject of a sentence, that society can be a cause of something. And society as a concept has a very different kind of contract. Right, so the contract of society as a concept is society is omnipotent, and as much as you believe that, as much as you agree to that, you are able to research, uh, like to gather knowledge by researching this abstract con concept of society. Right, you uh, you give up your freedom, you give up your control over the world, you give up this kind of God-given freedom. And in return, you get knowledge. That's like, that's a very basic uh, operation of this concept of society, right? Like, as invented by Durkheim, as explicated in his uh, books about like, religious forms. Uh, and, um, and, it's, and it is in comparison to this kind of concept, to this kind of knowledge operation, I would compare the way uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, kind of works in a sentence, right? Because artificial intelligence, it's also this kind of concept. It's also a subject of a sentence. Like artificial intelligence showed me this influencer. Artificial intelligence made me buy uh, this book, right? I, I mean, it's uh, artificial intelligence wrote this text. Artificial intelligence is going to destroy humanity. It's, we, uh, we also want to put it in a, in a subject position of a sentence and in the, by doing this, we uh, look for some kind of different kind of contract, right? It's, we're not content with saying, you know, society made me do that, right? Like it's, it's, we mean a slightly different thing by that. And um, why is it reversed though? You said it's, it's in, in a reverse way. No, it's, it's not, I mean, it's, uh, it looks like it's in reverse way, but I think it's a little bit more complicated. So let's look at it. So I would uh, kind of sim summarize it by saying that um, you know, if you look at the way, the way contemporary AI research is done and like not even research, but like how it is used because it's uh, used, AI system is always used. It's never, it's never just like an object of research, right? Unlike sociology, right? So sociology is the contract, the contract is you don't 
interfere, you stop acting, you interpret away your practice, and then you get knowledge. But a system, on the contrary, is only practical. It can only be practical because this is the very concept of machine learning, and we don't have any other concepts of how it can be. So it always learns by doing, it always learns by being practical, it always does something, looks at the results, and reconfigures itself accordingly. So uh, like first first kind of difference is, uh, so Alexa just like, wanted something from me. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and um, the second kind of difference is that it's not passive, but active, right? It's kind of sounds similar, but I think it's, there is a very good uh, example here, but a, a little bit more bit, I guess, which is, you know, the book of Durkheim on suicide, right? And so, uh, uh, Durkheim picked suicide specifically because for, you know, German romanticism, it was such an important individual act of, you know, self-imposed will. And then he says, you know, no, it's society that, that makes you do it. It's like, it's your like, uh, like effects that I can statistically predict uh, that make you, or not you, I got a, a person um, uh, get rid of their life, right? And so, and uh, that, that's like the, uh, the way, and then he proceeds to create a series of concepts such as society, yes, and anomy, and some other ones that helps him explain this link between uh, uh, like a kind of material situation and a suicide. But if you look at how, how it looks like, what would be artificial intelligence analog of this book right now? And I think the AI analog of this is, you know, when you don't even know that you're deeply depressed, you don't even know yet, but Amazon tries to sell your rope, right? Just like, like in this, uh, remember that story about this pregnant woman who did not know she's pregnant until, you know, she's like, it's the same thing. Like, like it's just Amazon just like sells your rope, a little bit of soap. Uh, like some knives, like something like that. Or, you know, you, uh, like you, uh, I don't know, like you can come up with like these examples. I, I don't, I, <laughs> it's, uh, it's too perverse. Oh, so Durkheim explained to you how suicide works based on the concept of society. AI actually tells you, here it is, go kill yourself. Yeah. And in this sense, it's active and it's kind of, you know, the deep dream, like I see it on, uh, Tseno Bio, right? That uh, avatar, this deep dream thing that kind of it recognizes a hint of eye and then it just like makes it more into an eye. It recognizes a hint of dog, it makes it into more a dog. And then like Amazon recognizes this hint of depression, this hint of desire, you know, to like buy a stupid book, this hint of desire to like listen to some like, like weird music. And then it just like pushes it on you and like it's, and in this sense, it's active that it's not just not just recognize forms in the world, but imposes these forms as soon as it's, it it can like recognize a little bit of them. So that would be the second difference. Right? Um, and yes, yeah, so to go back to to knowledge, and it's to like how knowledge functions here, right? So an interesting thing, like we, we all learned how to use AI systems, right? We, you all know how to use them. You all already use Google, right? That maybe you remember because I remember this times when you had to learn how to use Google, right? You had to learn like a little bit of syntax, maybe just like, I don't know, right, right now, I think like this, uh, I mean, it's uh, kids those days, you know, they probably just know it, but uh, like for us, it was like, you learn to add, uh, download for free when you want to download something for free you just like learn this kind of syntax and uh, like you learn to ignore some kind of results like you learn stuff but at the same time you unlearn some things like there is this thing that people who like this kind of techno optimists always say which is you know i'm so excited about google because i don't have to remember uh, historical dates anymore and uh, like why you ask like it's, it's such a weird thing to say in my opinion and then they say because like the moment i need it i can look it up but like why, why like if you don't know anything about history why would you ever need to look them up it just like makes no sense but there is this sense of unlearning there is this sense of 
this kind of information that you willingly give up to Google. And that is part of your learning. Like as soon as you learn not to remember dates, as soon as you learn not to calculate things by hand, as soon as you remember not to learn phone numbers by hand, you, in this unlearning, you learn how to use Google or like some other tool, right? And uh, so, so there is this sense of kind of knowledge becomes divided into uh, like into two, two, two different parts, right? So one part is using the actual tool. And another part is the knowledge of the world that this tool provides to you. So um, you focus on mastering the tool as removed from the world. And then the tool guarantees you that the knowledge of the world will be you know, at hand. Uh, and that's what we see really in a lot of, you know, kind of contemporary AI applications that it is, they are not done by people who are trained in this kind of old school way in sociology and anthropology, where you really, really carefully find like a conceptual structure of your experiment to make sure you're not biased, to make sure, um, you know, you use your uh, domain knowledge to find a good conceptual net. No, it's like the, like the less domain knowledge you have, the better AI tool can possibly be because you don't interfere with it, right? You like the more space, like as, as long as you have a powerful enough tools, of course, right? But as long as you have them, the more you give up your domain knowledge, the more you have a possibility to use this tool more powerfully, right? Because, uh, I don't know, because like, at least because your domain knowledge is imperfect, right? And it, it does not lend itself to such a quick and easy feedback loops as AI system, right? Like even, uh, I mean, even, even if you know your history very well, Google will still know it better, at least because it just keeps up with the current events. And uh, like if, if somebody suddenly finds out that French Revolution ended Two years earlier than it thought, you know, Google will first will be first to know. Uh, so there is this kind of split into two different kinds of knowledge, and this split is what I think. Like this tool I showed is uh, shows really well, as long as 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 well. It is highlights a little bit how grammar works in this kind of more general sense, and also like what's happened since the chat. It's 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 interesting, right? Because uh, this kind of generative, uh, like this kind of tools for generative text. If you look at them, there is this GPT-3, and then there is all the text it writes, right? And then like, what, um, you know how uh, I would approach that? Like, you know, just just, uh, just look on, at Mark on GPT-3, Valentin. A what? very good a very good article was published on Financial Times like ten hours ago on GPT three. If it wasn't so confusing last minute, I would have sent it to people. But I have it available, and I will somehow uh, send it to everyone to read because it's it's very uh, very like it's Financial Times, but it brings in sort of like pro and agnostic and anti GP three people into discussion. It's a very interesting article, but I'll, I'll share it with the group later. Go ahead. So my question would be, yeah, well, look at Mark Zuckerberg and what does he know about friendship, right? Like he built this tool that is like the, the, uh, the most uh, important tool for friendship right now, but he, he's clearly quite clueless about it, right? It's just like, it's, it's fascinating. And, um, uh, and it's, and it's kind of a common trope in all of this research. Like the less you have domain knowledge, uh, the, the more you're powerful, but he knows something, right? Like there is a, something that he knows really well that we either don't know or like some of us know and the ones who know, like they can do it. And what he knows, I can, like my interpretation would be, is the difference between you know left and right side of the screen that is being shared, like between grammar and between what is being produced, between you know all of these contingent individual friendships uh, that we regard as knowledge about true friendship, and 
for what he sees as very basic, very impoverished, very uh, simple structure, very simple grammar of what friendship is, that for him, like the simpler it is, the better for him it is. The more perverse it is, the better for him it is. Because like it, it just allows him for more and more possibilities, right? So uh, in this sense, like people who appreciate GPT-3 for the texts it generates, who reads all of those texts and like, just adores their beauty, it's 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 one it's it's one thing to do with GPT three, but there is another thing is to master it itself and uh, and by discounting uh, all of this text by recognizing their absolute uh, transience and contingency and uselessness. And that's 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 another thing, right? Like in this screen, you if like if Castro clicks real roll, you we get like a new set of text, right? Which is like it's they immediately thrown out and uh, new, new texts are being generated. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a weird grammar. But, uh, and uh, when, what, what happened when, when, we, when um, this proposal was uh, concerning, uh, like proposal for us to do, was only concerned with the content, right? With the, like these words that have been there, but with not grammatical rules. Uh, what happened is that by focusing on only on words, whereas like a, a lot of things are produced that just uh, I don't uh, like just we see how much chaos there is, and we see how absolutely useless it is to just look at it. Like there is like there is no 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 reason to just like explore it, and uh, this kind of other other approach like that uh, like AI. Uh, incarnates is, uh, as the contrary, like you just completely ignore the cows, you never interface with it, it's yourself. You have this tool that uh, doesn't care about biases, doesn't care about uh, concepts, doesn't care about anything. And you just like, you use it for a particular. So yeah, I think like my, my questions, like in, in what I said, like my questions about like, what is the grammatical structure of how we use AI is, I think, more interesting than what I like gave as an answer because it's like a little bit less systematic. But uh, yeah, that, that would be my, my my final point. Like there is a there is a different kind of knowledge that people who use AI as a tool have, and it's very different uh, from the knowledge that people who like uh, traditional sociologists, uh, and it's different uh, not in its content, but in its stance in the world. And uh, it's like the very difference between those two kinds of knowledge, right? Like for a philologist, with generated texts are interesting, right? But for this kind of AI yeah, researchers, the grammar of them is, uh, might be more interesting. Like this, this difference is the key here and learning to recognize it is exactly learning to use AI because it, uh, it's like with Google, like you learn what you can give to AI to do and what you have to do yourself. And that's, uh, that's the mo most important part of it. Okay, should I, should I say something about the tool? Uh, maybe, 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 it's, maybe it's good if, if Brunella like engages what you said, because you began by engaging what Brunella was talking about. So maybe we should just like try to see if Brunella would like to engage your propositions here. Yeah. No, very interesting. It uh, makes me think uh, of so many things. Uh, if I understand you well, uh, that the, still the problem is contingency, how contingency actually shapes uh, meaning and how grammar fixes uh, meaning. Uh, I wonder if uh, uh, you would, uh, Valentin, you think, uh, Valentin, that this uh, couldn't, uh, this, couldn't this be reduced to the, you know, uh, uh, traditional uh, semiotic distinction between parole and lang? That is, uh, the lang is a grammar documentation, this uh, open, you know, this black box of speaking that is actually fixed uh, on documents. Whereas la parole is uh, what is uh, spoken every day, 
and modifies language and meaning every day. As you say, uh, we say AI and we think that we know what it means, but actually we don't. <laughs> we don't in its full <laughs> meaning. We uh, make it, we turn it into a subject, we turn it into a, a substance even if there's no substance in it. Uh, so Kant couldn't be say, so you, so you you talk about the split, splitting between our knowledge and the uh, automated knowledge that knows more than we do. Uh, but uh, couldn't we work together? Couldn't, this, uh, couldn't we think that this can work together? And uh, hasn't these always worked together? Because another thing that you may, th may think is of the difference between oral traditions, oral environment, uh, and uh, literate environment. In preliterate environments, uh, uh, maybe you might say there, were, there was no uh, grammar in the sense that there was no uh, fixing of meanings because the flow of continuous events uh, wasn't fixed, it wasn't turned into um, discontinuous uh, discrete atoms, uh, which is exactly what grammar does, which is exactly what AI does. AI taking uh, uh, mountains of data, turns uh, the continuous flow of events uh, into atomic uh, uh, quantitative data, which is an abstraction actually. So uh, would you think that uh, this uh, um, split uh, uh, couldn't be simply considered as natural or, or naturalized? Uh, I think of the new generations that uh, use AI, I mean children, okay, very young children, they use cell phones as if they were natural, as if uh, uh, as uh, the way we use uh, grammar and syntax. What do you think? Can, can't you think that this split is actually naturalized? So, um, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, thank you for this um, explicitation of the split. Uh, that is uh, very, very important for me, definitely. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a very kind of traditional structuralist view that I'm, I'm proposing, right? That there is a structure that is you know, actually, actually acts, actually is uh, important. And then there is meaning that is just kind of secondary and it's no more than an effect. And it's in some cases you can only say like there is meaning only because you try to interpret it. But when you speak, you don't actually think about it. Like you, you think grammatically. And, but then like there is this different, like there is this a small difference or small question you can, we can ask Sassur, right? Because, uh, so what is this grammatical rule? if there is not actually a rule, right? If we don't subscribe to this Chomsky linguistic, right? And we say, you know, it's all like this kind of precedent-based system, right? It's all about like examples and examples and examples. And then you learn by examples and then you create new sentences on, this, on the basis of these examples, like AI systems do, but also like Saussure would say people do without like referring to grammar, that is uh, grammar as a system of rules that is, uh, you know, being imposed on language uh, by scholars later, right? Because obviously in, uh, what, what was it, preliterate environments, there's obviously it was not just uh, completely stochastic speech, right? They would, they would uh, use sentences and they would use them in a familiar ways. And it is on this like, to kind of formalize this familiarity of sentences you speak uh, with, you create uh, this kind of idea of grammatical roots, right? And like, how, so how, how does it work? Um, uh, I don't know, but what I know is uh, this kind of, the mo this moment when you impose or uh, dig out or invent these grammatical rules that you say are grammatical, that you notice in your speech and you say, okay, here's how I notice, is, uh, is the moment that became a moment of control, right? It's, it's a difference between, like it's uh, different authors, like maybe say differently, but I think like the most important for uh, his philosophy was, was this Lacanian distinction between empty speech and full speech, because full speech is a speech which changes your uh, subjective position. So it changes a little bit the grammar, right? It, cha it's, 
it's not just it it doesn't just use the le- like all of the rules all of the precedents all of the sentences you already said to say them again it's some kind of sentence that you would never say not because it's ungrammatical in english but because it's ungrammatical for your own grammar it's like you never said i could be a woman right you never said i could be i don't know president of united states right like something like this right? and uh, uh so that's that's kind of this distinction but this distinction like for for uh, i mean does it does it require consciousness of of this rule right and um it's it's, it's not clear right i mean it's many but people think, are conscious yeah. of their rules so it doesn't really help them i want i want to i want to ask you something uh you know you the distinction you made between the way uh, a traditional anthropologist or sociologist define the society or the tribe right and then the way ai does something right now you know let's let's hybridize this right because we already have something called the sociologist idea of ai right not just like you know what i mean like the humanity people's idea of all of this we're kind of part of that too right like because we're we're still operating in this type of 20th century mode of thinking which is more like Durkheimer than something else right what about the other way around like what is what do you think would be an ai conception of sociology or like ai conception of humanities and how does it like which is actually won't be idea which we need to ask how is ai changing sociology or how are ai is changing knowledge production and then the two models for that that i would like to talk to you about one is that sort of like the 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 the, the good scenario right it relates to the kind of work you were doing for the company that you're working for right like basically realizing that you cannot and i'm not going to get into specifics of it because it's probably like company secret whatever but you can get into it yourself right that basically ai alone is not able to fulfill the complex task that the startup or the app is supposed to do therefore the ai has to be somehow infused with some kind of human uh, intervention to sort of like make sure that 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 then together they can work right so basically elevating each other's like understanding the other one is like a proposition given in this financial times article by an ai ethicist in um stanford university or something and even though i'm not a techno pessimist i give some credit to her right she basically says that the downside of this is that um uh, you know like if you if you let your t- copy edit be written by gp3 if g The, the gp3 starts producing content for us that is super smart it actually is downgrading human intelligence so what happens is she's saying like humans are already writing for likes and for 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 attention online we are already becoming gp3 why do we need, even need gp3 we already through the process of mediation we are downgrading the way we think in order to be counted in the in the algorithmic system so we're we're dumbing down so maybe that's how we're going to match match the intelligence of ai it's not like ai is going to reach to human it's like we're going to go so down that we're going to become like the sort of like a dumb machine that but you know what i mean so this is a sort of like the another another split another doubling but also relates to how you divide it up so um so uh, also I, I, Manila, it would be amazing to get your view on what i said because it shouldn't just be it's like uh, i don't know if valentin you. wants to speak first yeah valentin first go ahead valentin so on, on on the second view you know what what i think we should learn all of us should learn as humans and we are learning it already right it's not like it's not like we should go and learn like it's it happened is with kind of recognition of his grammars behind this text right you know right now you look at gpt3 and you think oh my uh, output and you think oh my god it's such a unique text but you know it's it, it's clearly is not like you you can learn to recognize and it's like you know you talk to a person and he says oh i i support uh, like i don't know um, i don't know i support minorities but i am against violence and i also like to listen to mag de marco and i'm also like unique in this sense and unique in this sense and unique in this sense and then like you see and it's you compress all of this to just like i'm 
like uh, American bourgeois liberal, right? It's like everything they say is just like uh, repeating the same fact again and again and again and again and again. And this like GPT free model, it's trained on uh, like internet posts that Reddit users uploaded five times, right? It's just like, and when I look at them, I was like, yes, this is a post that Reddit users uploaded five times. But that's, that's all there is to, in a sense, right? It, and it's like learning to recognize those things is immediately removes all of this problem of, you know, like people uh, like dumping down or not, because it's it's just like you, you just go beyond it, right? It's like it's like people who like pop music, right? Like they 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 go beyond all of this like the dumbness of it because there is like a lot a lot there is to, that there is to it beyond it. Right. So the moment you start start to understand the kind of basic structure of it, it just like it it, it just like completely compresses away and all of this like additional stuff is just like you can just ignore it and it's it, we you all you all learn to 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 do it already like I, I don't I mean you know you look at you look at it really complex interfaces it's like and, and then you just like you, you see what to do it's fine so this kind of dumping down I don't know it's like it's everyone would say this right like it's what I said about it's not dumping down it's unlearning right and it's unlearning in this uh, negative sense yeah, I mean, like it's it's interesting, but that definitely splits kind of positions, but splits very familiarly, right? So to go back to the first, so there is two positions here that we can kind of have. One is a position of a person who is in command of AI two, right? And this is position of unknowing, right? Of like I don't want to know. I want my AI two to know. Like I don't want to recognize uh, dogs and cats. I want my computer to do it fine. And that's like it's it's not just it's I'm not saying it's not a moral argument like it's this is like a like not a, it's a practical thing they have to do they have to stop recognizing dogs and cats to let computers do it and another position is this kind of like what what would call be called a hysteric position like but like, let's not think about negative connotations which are none like this is position that always looks at AI and says you didn't notice this you didn't notice this you didn't notice this here's your bias, here's your bias. And there's always like, you know, this kind of, as the AI expands, there's always going to be these fields that are, he's blind to, it is blind to. And then there's going to be always this hysteric position and this knowledge is going to be always be produced. It's not new at all. It's like, it's it's how it's been since, uh, like according to like Freud from, uh, I don't know, Copernican revolution, I guess, right? It's just like the moment you realize you're in, uh, unconscious, that's it, like, you know, because like, you, as long as you have this concept of, like somebody doesn't know their own bias. So, like, so. go ahead, go ahead, Brunella. And like to, to yeah. add to this, the last thing is, you know, is we can imagine this kind of AI with, that knows everything, right? That this kind of omniscient AI, but this kind of society that is run but omniscient AI, but it would be it would be at the same time omniscient and omnipotent. Like the, the only way I can see it is not. It, it's just going to be an AI that just tells you what to do. You know, you it's, it looks at you, it says you are like anomic Catholic, it just like kills you. You know, it doesn't even wait for like society to kick in. Like it's just like, doesn't even need your suicide. It's just like, it's just like, it will do it itself, right? So this kind of um, uh, image is, um, yeah, I mean, like it, we we can. I don't. I don't think there is ever going to be a moment where like AI will just know everything without uh, like reconfiguring like the whole the whole thing. So yeah, I I think it's uh, AI is just like incarnation of this kind of. It's like after society was extracted from God as this kind of things that we can research, but is also omnipotent. Like this kind of AI or what became AI was this kind of residue. That was like actual practical use. <clears throat> yes, I have two, two comments about unlearning uh, two things. Uh, in every age, uh, humans have unlearned something. Was that the new technologies allow them not to think? Uh, for economic reasons, they unlearned very willingly something like people in, again, oral uh, preliteral traditions, uh, uh, they would, they need to orient themselves in space or in on the sea through the stars or to the trunks of the trees. Uh, 
uh, after you know the the, uh, the invention of the compass they didn't need and we don't especially need to orient it in space anymore so this unlearning is always uh, uh, present in transition of cultures and technologies. Something is unlearned because something more is learned. Uh, so again, I don't see it as a threat. The threat is <coughs> this, this is what you uh, make it, you clarify uh, very well. That is, uh, when AI make, uh, makes us notice uh, what we do not know, can be an advantage because it can be a training mate, can be an advisor. Look, so why not? They, they know that they are advising me, the algorithm is warning me that I'm going into a depression. Maybe I know in advance <laughs> it is an advantage. But the danger is that if AI takes the data from the majority of cases, it might uh, fall, f overlook the minority of cases. And this is the rare data. AI doesn't work with rare data, must work on a daily basis. So what about the rare data, which are, which is we, we whom? The ones who do not like to align with the majority. If the majority is racist, uh, there's something we must do <laughs> against that. So what to do if the majority tells and knows more, not knows, is what AI detects, okay? So AI detects depression in the majority. Maybe I belong to that minority that reacts differently. But if we want to turn it into something more positive and optimistic, uh, AI is changing us, as Mohammed says, and maybe making us, uh, make us unlearn something. But can't we think that we are also changing AI more slowly over time, on a slow time, but steadily, because we are changing AI steady, uh, slowly, because exactly as uh, the, the fixed language is uh, constantly, however slowly, changing, changed by la parole. La parole, that is spoken language, flowing language, is changing the structure. If you enter an Italian vocabulary now, you find a lot of technological terms that are in English. English has entered Italian. So we might imagine an English-Italian language like Italian came from Latin and from Greek. So this is la parole, that is, this is the, what uh, Mohammed calls the human intelligence that is not necessarily defeated because AI needs the human intelligence in order not to class, not only to classify it, but also because AI is stupid. It doesn't have the intelligence of interpretation. Uh, so I, I think this is a very good uh, uh, suggestion if uh, students must think of uh, imagining something. Uh, how, what about imagining a, a flowing AI that doesn't uh, uh, only um, work through predetermined rules, uh, but that from chaotic elements. The input is only chaotic elements and the AI should be able to find self-organizing rules that do not come from the data. I think it is not just an imagination, it's called unsupervised AI, unsupervised algorithm, maybe Valentin knows more, that is uh, AI now uh, can be unsupervised. It's not given rules, but it finds rules themselves itself. Might be a way, a way out, a more trustworthy AI that is a, a company, that is a good companion rather than an adversary. I see that, that you know, being a danger and being a, a, a a companion are two possibilities. I think they are equipossible, equiprobable. Uh, I propose that Maria, who's been basically providing us some grammatical rules, which we will use to sort of like, come on and maybe, maybe interrogate Valentin about this. I mean, both of you, because you both emphasize this structuralist view of of a structure and then the data, right? So yeah, Maria, do you, would you like to like um, ask, ask a question or two? 
from yeah. our participants. Yeah, uh, I didn't disclose that my first education, I was a linguist. I was not an art, an art historian. I learned that afterwards. And as a linguist, I, I didn't invent those rules. I took them, uh, two of them from the Tatar language, one of them from a pidgin language. When you double the root, this is past tense. Uh, when you triple the root, this is future tense. And one of them is just invented English. In English, uh, a verb, always follows a noun and this is vice versa and i wanted to ask uh, valentin whether that would work with uh, with our system or how it will work at all i mean to be honest i i think you should just try the system it's uh, yeah we're, we're going to provide the hands on i brought an instruction system. you just like it's five steps very simple uh, i tried it on Two people they did it in two minutes it's just like and then you understand how it is but it's only two operations and i think it's like generative grammar it's it's not descriptive it's it's kind of the other way around like you give it uh like kind of things that it can just like generate uh, uh, sentences based on the structure that you pro propose mm -hmm. Uh, so I think uh, like your 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 rules. What was it to create like new uh, different tenses and di different uh, declinations of of words? You can definitely use them to uh, uh, like cre create new 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 uh, like good. But uh, I mean, this this grammar would be more interesting on the level of uh, new lexical uh, like generation or new mm -hmm. uh, new sentences that. Uh, uh, new on, on the level of like new, new ways to put words together, right? And one thing that you notice when you play with this grammar is that uh, sometimes you, you start with something very simple and very basic and very obvious, but then you notice that into places that you thought are obviously uh, clear, right? Like, for example, I wrote this grammar about like, uh, like bad things happening to good people, right? And then like, who are, who could be these good people? And then I noticed that these good people can be, uh, like I can add almost anything to this like group of good people. And that that subverts this grammar from this level of content, right? It's just like, and it's, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really strange, strange thing when you notice how, how you can uh, abuse your own grammar. That's what that's what is interesting for me here. But kind of to do it, you have to like first take it seriously and then fail at it and then give it up. But I'm I'm sure you'll figure it out. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send the link again. Jesse, if you want to join. Um, sure. Thanks uh, for the for the discussion so far, and also the chat has been really uh, interesting. How things have kind of like propagated and generated throughout. Um, I was wondering um, about um and maybe this is a little bit of a kind of like a sidestepping question but one thing that i'm i think i really agree on with one thing that uh Mohammed was saying earlier was um the the problem of like the past locked kind of past path dependency um that not only we're stuck with in terms of developing the systems but also thinking about the systems right so that we keep trying to refer to the things that actually effect change in the world with kind of a type of methodological theoretical framework that doesn't actually, that isn't actually able to account for the systems and the effects that they have. So in this regard, I'm kind of wondering how um, you think uh, that contingency is kind of like a productive site of investigation, because I would kind of contend that the contingency that might be a necessary aspect of uh, systems to to work whether you want to look at like the contingency of various interconnections of people with uh, systems or the necessary mathematical randomness for the systems to work in the first place um isn't that kind of uh also a kind of path dependency that we've already had like we've already had these conversations about contingency and they kind of and this is where I think Zuboff is also interesting because like in a sense, she argues that algorithms are path, the past dependent. So they threaten free will, free will. But then on the other hand, that presupposes a kind of capitalist subject that we all want to kind of get rid of anyway, right? So like why this sticking with this form of contingency when what these systems do inevitably fall into a horizon within which we refer to them without contingency. So, so why, 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 how is it a, a productive 
mode of engaging um, uh, these kind of new systems. I just want to say one word, and it's like contingency is sort of like the equivalence to like the sort of like fantasy of the nature compared to like culture or fantasy of the universe or cosmos, right? It's kind of like it just like it just like the fantasy of the unknown, right? And maybe we need it, maybe we don't need it. But we've carried this fantasy for like as long as civilization has existed, right? Now we call it contingency in our secular post uh, computational kind of like language, right? But it really is that, right? Contingency is like the last thing we have after God, right? That is the still like fantasy, but it's, it's really just like, as you said, it, it really, maybe that's like the last level of secularization is to get rid of, get rid of the fantasy of contingency. But go ahead, uh, Brunella and, and Valentin, if you want to respond to that. Uh, yes, no, I don't think that contingency is a fantasy. If there's only, the, the only thing we can be certain is that is contingency, that is uh, randomness. And, uh, you know, in this very moment, there's so much randomness around us. But anything that is contingent tends to become uh, ordered, tends to order. This is what we learn from swarm intelligence. So, uh, <clears throat> however, we are surrounded by contingencies, uh, Everyone, every every uh, you know, element that finds itself inside, every node, as you know, the technology, the AI experts would say, every node finds a link that reinforces its being a node. Node means an atom that, by linking with other nodes, become more and more uh, um, <coughs> ordered. And systemic, and so this is you know system theory. Uh, we uh, in any system we tend to turn every contingency into something systematic. If we go back to language, uh, those rules, those grammar rules, nobody invented them. There's not one individual who invented those rules. So I can imagine. I think that there can only be hypotheses about grammar rules. Uh, uh, become, uh, you know, a matter of fact. I can imagine chaotic expression, chaotic linguistic expressions, uh, kind of, you know, utterances, uh, chaotic, random, contingent, that tend to become lawful as any other phenomenon in nature and in culture and in, in language. So it's not necessarily that either contingency or not. Contingency is all that we have. AI, as any other system, is one, att one of many attempts to protect ourselves from contingency, and we become its victims. It's a feedback loop. So uh, contingency is what causes us to find the protection. AI becomes a, a means of protection until AI becomes a danger. And, then, and therefore, cybernetically, we need to find the next step, the next move to avoid or anticipate the danger. Uh, in a way that AI becomes conti a, co a contingent or, or a chaotic factor like uh, as uh, Valentin said, they know before I, if I'm depressed, okay, this, is, this becomes another chaotic element that I, I, I could either take advantage of or I could avoid. But uh, uh, so again, I think that contingency is a matter of fact, even when we deal with structures and systems. It's a matter of uh, randomness turned into order. Thank you, Brenda. We're we're at the we're at the hour. We were actually like original plan was to run run the seminar for till five thirty, take take a half hour break and start another one. But I think, given the the enormity of the data that's provided to us by you and by the by the others who are watching the video but are not in the in the in the seminar, it would be great to we provide you the link to the tool. You have, you all have, if you haven't co closed the chat box, you have the chat box here with all the stuff there. In, in the one hour, me and Martina and Kasra will just try to make sense of the data that you provided us by putting it into the system to bring, bring to the second session something cohesive. But you should also try to use, select some of these terms and words that can, you, it's not necessary. If you just want to go take a break and have an Aperol Spritzer, that's fine too. 
But if you want, you can also use the tool, take some of these words, select them, try to see, try the system, just copy paste the results and bring them with you in an hour to the second session where we will synthesize this into something meaningful, hopefully with the help of Reza and Patricia, right? But that's what me and Castro and Martino will be doing. We'll be sifting through all the terms, categorizing them into like nouns and verbs and putting them in the right place in the system. And then coming up with like different iteration of these texts and bring it in an hour in the link for the second video, which will be sent to you like 10 minutes before uh, 6 p.m. Berlin, 5 p.m. London, and whatever time zone New York and other cities who are participating are. How does that sound? So yeah, so the link is there. It's called the newcenter.org slash tracery. And the mm, sort of like guide and manual how to use it on the site. And you have raw data. You can scroll up and pick whatever word you want. If you don't close the window, you can also do select all and uh, copy it and put it somewhere and then use terms out of that. Try the system and see what you can come up with. And we will try our best to synthesize most of the terms and words provided by you and other, other participants. And see you in an hour. OK, thank you. Thank you, Brunella. And thank you. Thank you, Valentin. You guys are also welcome to join us if you feel like it and have the time in the second session with Reza and Patricia. But it's not necessarily needed because those will be our experts for the second session who will guide us a little bit through understanding what's going on. Okay, anyway, we can come back in one hour. Absolutely, we'll send you the link as well. Okay. It'll be good to see Valentin uh, pick, pick some points out of Reza and kind of like challenges him because they agree on some stuff and don't agree on everything. But it's, it's optional. Okay. See you guys. See you later. So, Mohammad, uh, I won't close this Zoom, so it's going to be on. But we're gonna yeah, be because people might need the need the, the text box on the side, right? Let's just give five minutes before you close it. No, I won't close it. It's going to be on. Okay.